and then we'll be right back to the screen. Okay. Hi, I'm Izzy, the principal investigator for the Coral Research Group at the Wildwood Institute for STEM Research and Development. Wizard has formed a new collaboration with the Mariner Ocean Research Institute at St. Monica Catholic High School to research emerging methods of coral restoration. Our project name uses the acronym ROCCS, or ROCKS. ROCKS stands for Restoration of Coral Using Ceramic Substrates. ROCKS addresses the need, for, the need for finding solutions to widespread coral loss due to bleaching events from sustained increased surface temperatures and acidification in the oceans. We would like to tell you about our progress, starting with Melanie, who's going to tell us about the growing corals in the lab. Thanks, Izzy. Hi, I'm Melanie, the Chief Operations Officer of the Coral Restoration Center, which is housed at the Mariner Ocean Research Institute, located on the campus of St. Monica Catholic High School. Previous research shows that fragmenting coral into very small pieces, about one square centimeter, speeds up coral growth. We are furthering research into this aspect of coral growth as a means to repopulate corals that have been irreversibly damaged by bleaching. Since we last reported in November, we have set up two research tanks. As shown in figure one, we obtain coral samples from unique corals located in Van Nuys, and we appreciate the time and help they have given us with choosing corals. Figure two shows our initial attempt at fragmentation. On the left is a parent with its polyps retracted. The middle photo shows the fragment adhered with cyanoacrylate gel to a small ceramic plug. The photo on the right shows the fragmented polyps beginning to emerge, indicating success. In the future, fragments will be placed on our own ceramic platforms, which we are in the process of designing and printing and will report on next. Hello, I'm Luca, the Chief Technical Officer at Mori. And I'm Toby, the Senior Project Manager at Mori. Last November, we presented hand-drawn designs meant for growing coral. Research shows that placing the coral fragments on ceramic structures is desirable from an environmental standpoint rather than materials such as plastics, metals, or concrete that can leach pollutants over time. Figures three through five show the evolution of our platform designs and the resulting clay prints from our ceramic 3D printer. The PotterBot 7 presented several unexpected challenges. The clay printer had a larger nozzle, four millimeters, compared to the standard 0.4 or 0.6 millimeter nozzle on a traditional PLA or ABS 3D printer, which we used to prototype our designs. We approached our first designs with a traditional 3D printer in mind, but it never occurred to us that printing in clay would be so different. We found that the PotterBot cannot quickly retract the extrusion to jump around as it prints. And we had to think of the extrusion as happening in a continuous line, like a game of snake or drawing on an etch -a sketch Our platforms morphed from highly detailed structures with tight patterns to structures that are very simplistic. Figure three shows our initial diamond design, which was not a success. Figure four shows what we call the lily pad model, which had too much curvature. Our third iteration, shown in figure five, was a low complexity design. We modeled this design after a hog slat, which is utilized in animal farms. This design is proving to be successful. In addition to the 3D or the ceramic 3D printer not being able to quickly retract the extrusion as it prints, we also needed to troubleshoot why the printer's motors randomly stopped during the print. We determined that the mass of our print plate was too great. Our original thought was to place a ceramic kiln shelf on the printing platform, print on it, and directly transport the finished print to the kiln for firing. This plan, though effective, created an unexpected problem. The additional mass of the kiln shelf and the print surface meant the motor had to accelerate more mass, activating its fail-safe mode and prompting a shutoff. We will need to print directly on the surface and carefully transfer the print to a kiln shelf for transportation. Currently, we have established protocols for preparing the clay for printing. We are still working out protocols for how to properly dry and fire the print. Next, we would like to report on our lighting system for growing corals. In our research portion at ROCKS, the small polyp stony corals that we want to propagate require high levels of light of, uh, light of certain wavelengths because of the dinoflagellate algae that live in their tissues. The corals are dependent on these symbiotic algae for energy. 
we're currently experimenting with a hybrid lighting system that uses a combination of T5 lighting and LEDs. Our T5 bulbs are three foot long tubes that provide diffused light over the six foot long tank. And our LEDs, whose colors can be adjusted, provide spotlights over the racks of corals. We're currently working on maximizing photosynthetically active radiation, or PAR, by changing the position of the lights, changing the glass covering on the tanks, changing the filter system to minimize air bubbles in the water column, and adjusting the depth of the water. Figures six and seven show the two components of our hybrid lighting. Figure six shows the T5s predominantly emitting light in the violet and blue end of the spectrum. Figure seven shows the light emitted by the LEDs whose color can be adjusted. Finally, we'd like to tell you about our initial design to motor and or to monitor and record coral growth. Um, I'm, I'm Izzy, the principal investigator for systems integrations. System integrations involves the collection, preservation, and distribution of data. In order to document the coral growth and other factors throughout this lab, we are investigating the use of photography and videography. A camera must be compact for easy positioning, usable in a saltwater environment, web accessible, cost effective, have an, have an adequate to high resolution, and be able to take scheduled pictures. Given these constraints, the Raspberry Pi, a microcomputer, and its compatible camera showed to be fit for our goals. The Raspberry Pi was constructed and the camera was attached. A micro SD card was inserted into the Pi, allowing us to configure the microcomputer and assign it an IP address using an attached monitor and keyboard. Once the Pi was on the Wi-Fi, we were able to use a virtual network, a uh, virtual network connection, VNC, into the Pi using any laptop. This allows us to code and manage the Pi remotely from locations other than Mori. We have programmed the Pi camera to take photographs and videos. Once taken, the photos and videos are automatically stored in the memory on the Pi. Images are transferred from the Pi to a repository and then to our own computer using FileZilla, a file transfer protocol, FTP, app, using us, um, allowing us to upload and download files to and from the Pi. Figure eight shows test photographs taken by our Raspberry Pi. Our next steps are to set up the Pi with the tanks. We're currently researching designs that will hold the camera in place to capture data while protecting it from salt residue. We will also determine how to code the Pi such that pictures are taken at regular intervals. Then we will start trials using the code we believe will best fit our research goals. Thank you for listening. To follow our progress, check out our Instagram and Twitter page at wizard. Hi, I'm Steven and previously I worked with Arduinos using Tinkercad simulations. Now I work with a physical Arduino board as well as a multitude of sensors, motors, and switches. And this work in Wizard Labs can meet the need for systems integration. An Arduino is a microprocessor that reads input and turns it into output. For example, my first picture, figure one, is a basic unit that just supplies power to an LED, LED but it can be coded to link at to blink at time intervals, for example. And my second picture, figure two, is a more complex unit. It's a servo motor with more parts that need more coding to make it work. I, I intend to complete the examples provided in the diagrams book before applying what I've learned to other wizard projects. Thank you for listening. Hi, I'm Ian, the PI for Recon, here with my partner. Uh, I'm Reed Allenstein. And today we're just going to tell you about Recon. So Reed, take it away. Yep. So Recon is the Research and Education Collaborative Occultation Network. And Recon has 57 telescopes along the west coast of the United States. Recon is funded by the National Science Foundation, or NSF. And its main goal is to detect objects whose orbit around the sun transits Neptune's orbit. So these are called TNOs. And these events collect visual data of stellar occultations, which further our understanding of the origins of our solar system. So you may be wondering, what the heck is an occultation? And I'll tell you that. So imagine you got yourself a star like this one right here. 
basically, to figure out the information about things that are really far away from Earth, scientists watch as an asteroid or a comet or a TNO, much like my fist, travels in front of the star, obscuring the light and then revealing it on the other side. From this, you can get a lot of information like the speed of the object, the mass of it, what it possibly is made of, and its orbital trajectory, which is a lot of great data that scientists can use to discover more about the origins of the solar system. Now, Reed's going to tell you about what we've been doing during the pandemic. Yep. So a year into the pandemic, and so far, all of our recon teams have been adapting very well to the changes. So far, we've had occultational events that are typically a month apart, but they've been involved with very interesting TNOs. So as an example, just recently, the Wizard Recon team had the opportunity to observe an occultation caused by Haumea and its largest moon, Hiaka. On top of this, other occultation events, we have also been expanding into new software like PyMovie, which we've been using for light curve analysis. So as Recon has kind of shifted from being the minimum acceptable quality for the Recon group to kind of getting into its own stride scientifically, a goal we set for ourselves many years ago was being able to control a fully autonomous observatory that we could actually track multiple occultations from. And luckily that dream is now becoming a reality for the team. We recently acquired land up in Big Bear where we will be developing the Wizard Big Bear Observatory, which we plan to have as a permanent station for our LX200 Mead telescope. This will include a lot of different amenities, but mainly just being a place in a low light pollution area for our telescope to operate. We are currently still in the R&D phase of figuring out how we actually want to construct this observatory, but we have many designs, be it the conventional dome or a garage door opening a sliding roof model, but we still have much to go into detail on that. Our plans for extra scientific instruments include a weather station so that we can keep track of the weather there, as well as letting other groups like the cosmic ray detector use the observatory for better conditions. So. What's next for Recon? In the future, Recon is planning to incorporate PyMovie into the basic skill set of all Recon members so that each member will be able to take the images that we uh, record from our occultations and create light curve graphs out of this, which we can then study afterwards. So this will be helpful because then Recon can study its own data and we can also have more to do outside of occultations. We've also been contacted to help with NASA's Lucy project New, the Lucy project is a telescope, or not a telescope, sorry, a satellite that is being launched and will travel around Trojans in the solar system. Recon will be using its telescope to help study the Trojans that Lucy is passing by. This is actually a very major project and a great step for the Recon group as we are now cooperating with other administrations and corporations and organizations. The Lucy project will be a major launch by the 2030s, and we are doing the preparatory stages for them and helping them out. Thank you so much for listening. All right, so I'm Will, and I did uh, aerodynamics. Okay, so what is aerodynamics? Aerodynamics is the study of forces and the resulting motion of objects through the air. In more simple terms, the way air moves around things. If something is aerodynamic, it means that the object can slice through the air without cre creating lots of drag or resistance. The wizard wind tunnel will study drag on aerofoils using open SCAD with uh, Justin Redman to control variables on 3D printed pieces. All right, and the use of aerodynamics. Aerodynamics is used in many ways like, the, like in the automotive industry and planes. In the automotive industry, aerodynamics is important at high speeds. A more aerodynamic car uses less energy. Aerodynamics can be tested in a wind tunnel where smoke patterns can be studied as they pass over the car. In planes, aerodynamics is a must and the study of aerodynamics is used to improve lift as well to lessen drag. Okay, and the future of aerodynamics in the wind tunnel group. So aerodynamics will play a big part in the future of the wind tunnel group. Now that we're slowly migrating back to campus, the wind tunnel group will have our wind tunnel back and running in the near future. With a working wind tunnel, this allows for great opportunity to study and create objects through the 3D printer to test. Thank you.
Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Jackson, and I'll be talking about OpenSCAD. So uh, OpenSCAD is a 3D modeling software, um, and it is used to create more complex structures than other uh, 3D modeling softwares like Tinkercad and uh, Onshape. So OpenSCAD, uh, unlike pretty much any other uh, 3D modeling software, uses coding directly to uh, place objects. And so uh, as you can see in figure one and figure two, uh, in the left side of figure one, there is code that is placing each one of the cubes that makes up the cone that I created. And in figure two, it shows the code that I used to create the figure three image. Uh, so open SCAD uh, is very difficult to use because of its coding. Uh, it is its own coding language. There isn't really one that is similar to it. Um, however, I used a couple of different books to help me learn the basics. And those are in the bibliography in the bottom right. Um, however, OpenSCAD is also very uh, helpful to create objects such as fractals because those are uh, an object that requires many, many, uh, like, uh, what, what, would, what it would be called, um, many recursions of itself and copies of itself that would be hard to hand place or hand design. Whereas using OpenSCAD, it can be placed very easily just by setting an extra line of code to repeat something. Um, so this would be very useful uh, when we do something with the airfoils in the wind tunnel, because I can set a line of code where if I just change one or two variables, I can get a very different shape and design, and we'll be able to visualize the airflow uh, for in like for the wind tunnel, uh, and so. In the future, I'm hoping to be using OpenSCAD uh, to design more complex things. As of right now, I haven't gotten super far into the uh, complex side of OpenSCAD, but I'm trying to get there just slowly um, because it is a very difficult learning curve. Uh, but as of right now, I've created the parabola, which is in figure one. I made a 3D parabola where I spun it around in 360 degrees and printed a copy for every degree. And in figure three, I created a 3D sine wave with the sine wave going in both uh, X and Y directions. Uh, and so as of now, that's where I've gotten to. But in the future, I'm hoping to design an airfoil, which will be very difficult because that requires a very complicated formula. Uh, thank you for listening. Um, hi, everyone from the publications team. I'm Danny. I'm the senior editor of Wizard Publications, um, and I work with our publisher, Scott Johnson, and assistant editor, Nana Brown. She can't be here tonight, um, but I'm just going to tell you a bit about what we do. So in Wizard and beyond, students will find that writing is a foundational skill to research and development. And as editors of Wizard Publications, we've worked to build support for the development of scientific writing skills in Wizard, provide opportunities for students to engage in high level scientific writing and connect them with the best resources and mentors. So one avenue we've taken to achieve these goals is through the publication of Wizards Magazine. This May, we are looking forward to the publication of our latest issue of the Inquirer, um, which is Wizards Popular Science Magazine, written, edited, designed, and published by Institute members. So recently, we've also forged collaborations with Dr. Amiel Moreno, who's a Wizard Fellow and our writing coach, and students in Wildwood's graphic design class who provided us with designs for the magazine. So in this issue, Institute members submitted pieces on biotechnology, earth and space sciences, climate policy, and more. We publish the Inquirer twice per year to bring more exposure to the Institute in the scientific and education communities. Um, we also publish the Wizard Journal in the spring, which is the Institute's original research publication, including papers from various lab groups. The journal provides Wizard members with the opportunity to develop strong technical writing skills and analyze their work in Wizard. Currently in progress is a research paper out of the Salinity Hydroponics Group in Wizards Life Sciences Lab, who plan to publish this spring as a culmination of their research over the past four years. Um, an upcoming collaboration between the publications team and the Wizard Board is the Wizard Handbook. 
So after the 2019 UCLA review of the Institute, the board received feedback that one major contributor to Wizards retention rate um, being low at times is that many new members feel overwhelmed by the lack of structure in Wizard and have difficulty finding a lab that they have or can develop the skill sets to work in. So to remedy this, the Wizard board formed the Wizard Handbook Committee, which is chaired by our assistant editor, Nena, um, and the committee is charged with developing a handbook to orient new members in the Institute um, by providing overviews of each lab, skills to work in the lab, and how new members can develop those skill sets. So the goal of this initiative is to improve retention rates by providing additional support to new members and helping them integrate more smoothly in, into the Institute model. Um, Wizard is also branching out into visual media. So in the fall, one of our Wizard members, Ian N, produced the Wizard Rap video, which is a fun and creative way that he was able to highlight the work of each lab. And in the spring, um, Wizard member Honor D created the Women of Wizard video to highlight the experiences of women in the Institute. Um, finally, be on the lookout for new releases of the Wizard podcast. We're planning a special senior recap episode with our graduating Wizard members. And there's also an exciting conversation um, with the Coral Research Group from Wizard and the Mariner Oceanographic Research Institute which is the newest branch of our life sciences lab. You can follow along with the research, writing and developments going on in Wizard on Twitter or Instagram. Our handle is just wizard um, or on YouTube. Our channel is Wizard Wildwood and our website, which is wizard.org. So thank you to Wizard, our COO, Joe Wise and our Wizard writing coach, Dr. Amiel Moreno for your support of Wizard publications. Hello, my name is Luis Perez. I'm a junior here at Wildwood, and this is my second year in Wizard. I'm currently working on systems integration, MySQL, Raspbian, and Pandas. This past year, it's been a challenge since we've been in remote learning. So we've had to find out a new way to collect data from home and insert it into the Wizard server. So that's where MySQL, Raspbian, and Pandas comes in. Raspbian is an operating system on a Raspberry Pi, which is a computer that allows data collecting software such as MySQL and Pandas to be downloaded. This has been the backbone in creating Wizard's data collecting website. The image in the center is an example of a data of Raspbian being used to download a data collecting software. MySQL is also known as My Structured Career Language is a regional database that is used alongside Linux, which is another operating system and PHP program to create a fast display with categorized data and searchable information on any server. This is what has been, been used to create a wizard data collecting website. Pandas on the other hand is an open source software library written alongside Python for data science and analysis and machine learning tasks. Pandas reads data, analyzes it, manipulates it and stores it on a server. Pandas makes it so simple to do relatively hard tasks and very time consuming in a very efficient manner. My goals for this upcoming year is to continue working on expanding the Wizard Radio Astronomy website and incorporating other groups onto the project. Thank you. Hello, my name is Roman, and my two group members were Dawson and Justin Duig, and we are the uh, Onshape group. And Dawson, you can take it from here. Um, so our current project is working on, on with uh, Onshape to create a marble maze. And uh, as you can see in the bottom right, we have our proof of concept, and we are currently collaborating with uh, Stephen Creo to uh, learn to use the Arduinos for the programming. And um, within the second semester, I have learned the main stages of designing and producing a 3D object from the initial sketch up to the proof of concept and finally to the final product. 
Uh, in order to attain this, I've utilized uh, peer collaboration to learn on shape and the basics of engineering on a broader scale. Uh, Justin? Um, I'm Justin, I'm a senior at Wildwood and I've been in Windsor for three years. And my semester has kind of been split up into two main sections. The first, of course, is working with Dawson and Roman on the marble maze, giving help whenever it's needed throughout the process. And then the second is passing on like my knowledge that I've learned in Wizard. Since I graduate in June, my job is to um, take what I love, which is working with CAD on shape, seeing CAD at a bunch of different um, like websites to um, and designing with others so that I can teach that to my younger peers um, and like teach them how to work with online design in a way that they will enjoy. And then through the Marble Maze project, I've been able to have like one-on-one -on -one work periods where I'm able to offer my, offer my help to anyone that might find themselves stuck, whether it's a small task, like figuring out how to use a certain tool on Onshape or something that's completely new to the both of us, but will eventually allow us to work together as a group. And I feel that enjoying what you are learning and doing is the most important aspect of Wizard because it allows you to experience, um, it allows you to experiment until you find that one subject that you will eventually enjoy the most. So that's what I try and kind of pass down when I'm working with my peers and I'm presenting CAD to everyone in a way that is just as um, intriguing as it is useful. And yeah, just to elaborate on that, Dawson and I are both new to Onshape this year. And Justin has really helped aid us in our journey through learning the software and CAD in general. And I'd say that the main point of our project is not mostly the marble maze, it's just the skills we've learned this year and how we can apply that uh, to different wizard groups and just to wizard in general. And so we're able to make a lot of projects moving forward in the future. My current project is engineering. So there's been a problem with printing in Wizard. We haven't known the actual size compared to the theoretical size. And understanding the problem is essential for Wizard to produce usable 3D prints. To address this problem, I printed three different size cubes, four of each size. By measuring the outcome and comparing that to the desired size, I hope to document any pattern or correlation. Three questions were asked. Is the accuracy the same across all three sizes of cubes, i.e. consistency? How accurate is the print? And how precise is the print? I found that the larger the sizes were, the more accurate the print is. And there's no pattern between the, between the sizes. Secondly, the Ultimaker 3 Extended is very accurate and is consistently around 0 0.35 millimeters. Or 0.35% error on the cubes it printed. The Ultimaker 3 is also very precise, being 0.35% off of its other prints. From my research, I found that the larger prints were more accurate and that the x-axis had the least amount of error while the z-axis had the most amount of error. I look forward to calibrating the other printers once we're back on campus. Thank you very much. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Max. I'm a 12th grader here at Wizard. I've been here for three years and I've mostly focused my stuff in becoming more of a machinist. So I've learned how to use uh, CAD, 3D printer, CNC machine, laser cutter. If we have it in the wizard lab, I've learned how to use it. Um, so when transferring to digital and virtual learning this year, I found, a, I found it a lot, I found it pretty difficult to find work in wizard mostly because I would be the one that would, um, kind of contract to other groups and get them physical materials that they need. Um, so recently this semester I had found a fellow wizard member that had, was having trouble with the 3D printer and getting it to work. So instead of providing uh, actual prints for people, I, I'm going to try, I've been trying to aid people in helping them explore 3D printing for themselves. 
So um, my fellow wizard member, re, uh, we connected and um, I picked up the 3D printer. And um, the the kind of process that we had, I had to go through um, when trying to identify the problem and solving the problem, um, it, it took a decent amount of time. Um, but initially, uh, the problem with the printer was after about the fourth or fifth layer, um, the actual print and the filament wouldn't adhere to the print itself. So I knew that something was up with the actual extruder uh, and the hot end and not the navigation or the pathfinding of the printer. So I didn't have to touch the computers, which saved a lot of time. Um, when going in and identifying the problem, the first thing I had to do was really just inspect it to see, oh, is my problem just on the, on the outside, easily identifiable, but it was not. Um, but after watching many test prints and actually watching the uh, extruder itself, I realized that the gearbox was um, feeding filament into the hot end too fast and the hot end couldn't keep up with it, which really just meant that the hot end wasn't hot enough. So after a good amount of time and realizing that I could simply, um, I just had to go into the actual printer and turn up the default um, hot end temperature um, and we got it printed good as new. So um, I, I hope to like enable more wizard members in exploring such 3D printers if they have the resources themselves and uh, helping people get to where they wanna be. Um, and thank you. Uh, hi, I'm Max Aronoff Scherer with the Radio Astronomy Group and I'll be talking a bit about the abstract. So Wizards Astrophysics Lab recently added several radio telescopes Wizard collaborates with the Digital Signal Processing in Radio Astronomy, also known as Despiro Group, to develop these telescopes for research use. Uh, the project focuses on building telescopes that are specifically designed to detect waves that fall in the radio spectrum from the neutral hydrogen in our Milky Way. The center of our galaxy is a lot of neutral hydrogen. These neutral hydrogen atoms undergo a spin flip that emits energy detectable as a radio wave. Those waves travel about 25,000 light years and are detected by our telescope. Thus far, we've been using our telescope to collect data on the center of our galaxy, the Milky Way. And we currently have one functioning radio telescope that has been collecting data to be reviewed and analyzed by members of Wizard. My name is Emil. I've been a Wizard member for three years. I will be talking about the process. So the Radio Astronomy Group has been working on numerous projects regarding signal intensity and how the output of data differs when the telescope is positioned to different angles. Using VNC Viewer, an application that lets multiple users work on virtual desktop at the same time, the radio astronomy group is able to keep up with the telescope's findings in real time and convert its raw data into charts and graphs, which can tell us what points of day give up the strongest radio frequencies, as well as the highest and lowest temperatures. This data can be transferred between each user through file transfer protocols in which the radio astronomy group uses FileZilla. Through this application, the group can connect to the virtual desktop server and move files safely to their computers for safe storing. When the file transfer of numerous files has been completed, the group will update their telescope maintenance files, as well as the current operations files, which give other users and radio astronomy group an idea of what is happening at all times. Hello, I am Allison Sterling and I am the primary investigator of the Radio Astronomy Group. I'd like to talk to you a little bit about the data that we've been collecting. When studying the data, we receive the intensity at a range of frequencies from each specific, for each specific time. For our analysis, we use the frequency where the intensity peaks, which is in the range of 1.4204 gigahertz, the emission frequency of atomic hydrogen. Our telescope is tuned to this frequency. Of, uh, this frequency, so shifts from this frequency can tell us about the velocity of hydrogen we see. By studying both the intensity and the velocity of hydrogen, we are able to establish patterns and how these patterns change over time. This data will allow us to make a map of the hydrogen in our galaxy. One common way we have we analyzed our data is by comparing the intensity every hour over the course of the day. Members of the group are working on a code to automate this process. We hope that the study and the shape of the speed of the galaxy in the future um, 
In figure two, we can also see that the velocity changes from a red shift in the negative when the hydrogen is moving away from us and to a blue shift in the positive when it is moving towards us. The intensity gets um, changes and spikes as the Milky Way passes above us over the course of the day. In figure four, um, your, it shows the velocity versus time, um, and it can be seen that the velocity is possibly a sinusoidal graph or something similar. Hi, I'm Nana from the Radio Astronomy Group. Um, Wizard has helped facilitate the creation of the Wizard Astronomy Network, which includes the Radio Astronomy Club at Providence Day School in Charlotte, uh, North Carolina, Summerland Amateur Radio Club, also known as SARC, and Maine East Radio Astronomy Group. Members of this network use Wizard's radio telescope to conduct their own experiments and West Virginia University is currently using our telescope to collect data on deep space events. Um, hi, my name is Sadie Gardner. I'm a senior, a four-year wizard member, and a co-PI of the Salinity Lab project. I'm Danny. I'm also a member of the Salinity Lab. Hello everyone, my name is Jimena Perez and I'm also a co-PI for the Hydroponic Salinity Group. And our group is trying to determine the maximum salinity threshold a butter lettuce can tolerate while simultaneously thriving in an agricultural setting. So to test this, we're growing butter lettuce hydroponically, meaning we are not using soil. And we've built our lab so that we can control the water flow, nutrients, and salinity levels in order to observe their growth patterns under varying conditions. And we are using our research to find implications for the San Joaquin Valley salinity crisis, which affects a vast major, a vast number of California's crops. So over the course of the school year, a total of five salinity trials took place in a student built hydroponics lab, three of which were successful. Um, the lab allows us to control variables such as water flow, light, and nutrient levels. The trials last a total of six weeks from germination to the point of extraction. The graphs below show the data for the three successful trials. Uh, they show the average biomass, root mass, root length, and total biomass. Um, prelimi uh, preliminary indications from the lab support the idea that high salt concentrations reduce plant growth um, as you can see with the, with the staircase um, projectile in the mo like most right uh, graphs. Um, the data will further be analyzed and included in the hydroponic salinity group's upcoming research paper. So as the three of us approach graduation from the Institute, we're working towards publishing a research paper in the Wizard Journal. The paper will cover the construction of the lab research goals and outcomes, and the results of the salinity trials that have been conducted to date. We'll then use statistical analyses, including a factorial ANOVA test to determine whether there's a significant difference in plant growth between salinity groups, as well as a post hoc test to determine between which groups the significant differences may exist. Finally, we'll explore the implications of the findings of our study on the San Joaquin Valley and agricultural industry supports. Um, so the images on the lower right hand side of the paper um, are the timelines that will be used in our research paper. So the top image is the procedural timeline from seed germination to salinity differentiation. And the two bottom images are the experimental timelines, which span days 11 through 47, during which the sprouts are transplanted into the hydroponics laboratory, salinity differentiation occurs, and the plants grow and are measured over the following weeks. Oh, sorry. <laughs> so you can follow along with our research at our journal, which is wizard.org slash hydroponics. 
um, and you can access that the QR code in the upper right hand corner. And thank you guys for listening. I'm going to pass it back to Jimena. Okay, so our our project. Oh, what? Okay, well, wait, Joe, can you go to the next slide? Okay, so the um, hydroponic salinity project has the pleasure of collaborating with Dr. Davinder Sandhu. He is a plant research geneticist working at the U.S. Uh, salinity Laboratory in Riverside. He has published uh, 64 peer-reviewed journal articles and 10 book chapters. In addition, he has mentored over 100 undergraduate students on their research projects, of which he has co-authored in 70 publications within scientific journals. Dr. Sandhu has helped guide our uh, lab trials by suggesting the salinity concentrations. He has also offered to run ion analysis of the plant samples once facilities at the laboratory open up again. And so it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Sandhu and his presentation on salt tolerant crops, a way to cope with increasing soil and water salinity. You're muted. So do you, do you see my slides? Yes, we can see them. <laughs> so first of all, uh, uh, thank you, Sari, for, for the introduction. And I would like to thank you uh, for, for this invitation. And actually, I was very impressed with the width of uh, presentations we have seen in the last, last one hour. So lots of diversity, different kinds of work, very, very impressive. And I will, I will give this credit, some of this credit to Joe Weiss, who is guiding all this. And very, very impressive. I'm, I'm very impressed. <clears throat> so uh, today in my presentation, I'm going to talk about uh, salt tolerant crops. Uh, before I start on some of the research topics, uh, what I'm working on and some interesting results, uh, I would like to give a little introduction about uh, U.S. Salinity Lab. So we are part of uh, the uh, U.S. Department of Agriculture and Agriculture Research Services. And as I mentioned earlier, this is the only salinity lab in the country and very well known internationally. So we get uh, lots of visitors from many different countries every year. So some come here, work for six months, one year, some for a couple of months. We get lots of other visitors uh, visiting here, looking at our experiments. And uh, we collaborate with, uh, I would say, at a particular time, 10, 15 different countries uh, uh, every single year. So, uh, so I'm glad that I'm working at this facility. So before coming here, I was at the University of Wisconsin where I was professor. First I started as assistant professor. So then I was promoted to associate professor. Then I was professor there. Uh, so then I moved to, to this 100% research position. So when I was professor, I was teaching a lot. So, so I was, my, my uh, uh, teaching load was very heavy, but in, in addition to that teaching load, I was maintaining very, uh, very, very big research program. Uh, I used to have like 20 to 25 undergraduate students working in my lab at, at a particular time. So, and many of those undergraduate students, they, they did really good job and they were able to publish their work in scientific, scientific journals. So that's why I was mentioning earlier that if you get a chance to come to UCR, so get in touch with me right now. I have 15 undergraduate students working uh, in my lab. So they are, they are from UCR. So we have very good collaboration with UCR. 
<clears throat> so at the Salinity Lab, we have uh, nine different scientists. And I'm a geneticist. We have a microbiologist. We have one plant physiologist, one hydrologist. We have a computer modeler. And we have four soil scientists. So that is our core group. And then each of the scientists, they have a technician. And then there are other support technicians which run some facilities. And then we have uh, some temporary employees from UCR. And in addition to that, we have some, some students and some visitors from different countries. So, so we are about like 50 people working in this building. So right now from last one year, uh, many of the people are working from home. So, and uh, right now we're like seven, eight, 10 people uh, on a particular day in this building. So we, we got a pretty big building here. So very few people at this time, but hopefully this will open up soon and we'll go back to over hundred um, percent load and pick up our research. So which is lagging because of, because of this COVID-19. So of course we'll be able to do that iron analysis. We do that iron analysis for every single uh, experiment we do here. Uh, but the person who is running that, uh, she's working from home right now. So you can do iron analysis from home. So that's, a, that's, that's the problem. So, but soon we'll be, looks like we'll open up and we'll be able to uh, start that work. So here in this slide, you can see this is, this is our facility. Uh, these are our greenhouses. We have lots of greenhouse space. And then we have some outdoor space, which is also well built for salinity experiments. We have uh, sand tanks on the top, and those sand tanks are pretty big. And then below we have reservoirs. So water goes through reservoir into those sand tanks, and those are filled with sand, all that water goes back into the same reservoir. So it is, a, it is a circulation system. So very, very effective because we need to maintain uh, very strict ion concentrations in our solutions. So we maintain everything in the reservoir so that solution keeps running through, through our experiment and we are very precise in our uh, ion concentrations. <clears throat> so, for the experiment which, are, which I'm going to present today. So I'm going to talk about two main experiments. And for those experiments, this is our research team. So, uh, so we have two scientists, Dr. George Freire, who is plant physiologist. And we have here on the right side, I, on my screen it is covered, Dr. Don Suarez, who is, who, who is soil scientist. Uh, and then I have several uh, project scientists who are postdoctoral fellows uh, who worked on this project. Uh, Manju is my technician, lab technician, and Xuan Lu is Dr. George Ferreira's technician, and Monica was a visiting scientist from Argentina. And these are all undergraduate students who, who worked on this project. And I would like to thank uh, USDA uh, and Armored Board of California for the support for these projects. And uh, many different nurseries provided us uh, rootstock for almond plants. So th <clears throat> these are some of the projects which I'm not going to talk about today. Uh, in the lab, one of the project is on nanoparticles. We are using cerium oxide to see the effect of cerium oxide on germination under salinity. So this is just a uh, very preliminary results. You can see that in control, the seeds are not germinating under high salt condition, but when you add cerium oxide, so germination is a lot better. So that, that project is going very well and we got one USDA grant for that. So, uh, and two undergraduate students are working on that project. So one project we recently finished that is on spinach where we are, studying sodium potassium interactions and how they play a role in uh, salinity tolerance in spinach. So this is Dr. Uh, George Ferreira, and this is one of our experiment on strawberries. Uh, strawberries are pretty big in California. So, uh, so in this objective, we were trying to 
understand genetic interactions, what genes are important for salinity tolerance in strawberries. And there was one field experiment we had. Uh, so we have some land up, um, very close by here up the hill. So <clears throat> we were running one experiment on three uh, Solanaceae species. Uh, we had tomatoes, we had peppers, we had eggplants. We had eight different varieties of each and pretty big experiment. So, and again, we were trying to compare uh, different varieties and different species for their salinity tolerance and trying to understand the genetic mechanism play, uh, playing role in the in salt tolerance process. And we have a new project uh, on cluster bean, which is called as GOAR. Uh, you may have heard about this uh, in context of GOAR gum. So that is a commercial product, which is used in uh, United States and lots of GOAR is actually produced in India. So, but now there is lots of cultivation of GOAR is happening in the Southern United States or due to its commercial value. So we are trying to study if GOAR will be a suitable crop in marginal lands where the quality of soil is not good. So if we can grow GOAR in those, those regions. And there was one big experiment where we studied 400 different maize lines for uh, genome-wide association studies to identify quantitative traits that regulate salinity tolerance in maize. But today I'm going to talk about uh, two main crops. One is alfalfa, which is many cargo. Uh, and the alfalfa is relatively very tolerant to salinity. On the other hand, I'm going to talk about almonds. Almonds are very sensitive to salinity. So I'm going to talk about two, two extremes and how their mechanisms are different and what we need to, uh, what we have learned in the process of studying these two crops, uh, what is important and what markers we can use to screen different genotypes for salinity tolerance. So before I start on that, I'll go give a little introduction on uh, how plants respond to salinity. So once a plant is exposed to high saline water or soil, the first response is osmotic stress. It, we call it as osmotic phase. So that is the first phase. The plant feels like that it cannot draw water because there are too much salt present in the water. So plant cannot take up water. So it is like drought kind of feeling that plant is not seeing the water, all the water is present there. So that leads to many different problems. That leads to uh, change in stomato conductor, change in photosynthesis, which will result into stagnation of growth. The buds, they do not grow. The leaves, they do not expand. They remain very small in size. So one, once this phase passes, the next phase hits that we call it as ionic phase. Ionic phase is when the concentration of ions, primarily sodium and chloride, that increases in the leaves. So the sodium and chloride from the roots that goes in the leaves, as the concentration goes up, then it leads to, uh, it leads to uh, toxicity in the leaves. And the leaves, they started becoming yellow and they start senescing, they, they fall down. And slowly, if the concentration is too high, the whole plant dies. <clears throat> so when we, when we handle tolerance, we look at these two phases separately. The first phase, as I talked about, osmotic tolerance. So in this, if the normal growth of a plant was at this level, so shoot growth at this level, and you added salt to water, so it will reduce the growth. So this is the reduction now. So that is due to osmotic stress. And this is the osmotic phase, so growth is happening. And then after that, ionic phase hits. So then there's further reduction in growth. So if you want to improve osmotic tolerance, what you need to do is you have to save this drop. So this drop, which is happening from here to here, so you try to reduce that up to here so that it does not drop too badly. So that is osmotic tolerance. Then when you look at ionic tolerance, ionic tolerance is this, this drop is due to osmotic. 
but then this dot uh, drop is due to ionic phase. So you don't want this to drop. You want it to go straight. So there is no loss due to ionic toxicity. But if you want to do both, so then you have to raise it up here and keep it stable at this point. So that will be tolerant for both osmotic phase and ionic phase. So when we, when we try to, uh, to find varieties which can tolerate salt better, we have to look at photophases. <clears throat> so this is first phase alfalfa, Medicago sativa. <clears throat> so this experiment is going on, on for eight years now. So initially we started with this experiment uh, where we had 2,700 different genotypes of alfalfa. So we, we had large screen. Out of that screen, we were able to identify, identify 12 different genotypes. So, so those are listed here. And we actually numbered those from one to 12, just for simplicity. Don't go into too much detail here. So I'm going to just skip on all that, but I'm going to tell you here what we are looking for. We selected based on biomass, sodium concentration in the leaf, chloride concentration in the leaf, and potassium concentration. H means high, L means low, M means medium. So based on these four parameters, we were able to select these 12 genotypes out of 2,700 different genotypes. <clears throat> so now we wanted to do detailed experiment on these replicator trials so, so we can completely understand why these genotypes are different from each other and what is the mechanism behind uh, tolerance in different genotypes. <clears throat> so this graph here is showing you biomass under salinity, right? So in salt treatment. And this side is salt tolerance index. Salt tolerance index is the relative performance under salinity compared to the control. So if our under control is 100%, under salinity, if it is 80%, so your salt tolerance index is 0.8. So it is just simply dividing performance under salinity uh, by performance under control. So these are our 12 genotypes here, distributed here on this graph. So you can look at genotype three and genotype 10. The value of salt tolerance index is about one. So that means there is no drop in performance under salinity. So these two genotypes are performing as they were performing uh, in control. On the other hand, you look at some genotypes like nine. So there's 60% drop under salinity as compared to control. So there is quite a bit of variation. Uh, and when we are testing alfalfa, as I said, alfalfa is very tolerant to salinity. So we are screening this at uh, electrical conductivity of 18 decimal per meter. So when we look at salinity, salinity is measured in electrical conductivity, right? So 18 decimal is one third seawater. Seawater is about 54 decimal per meter. 18 decimal is very, very high. So you have one third seawater here. So based on that, we were able to identify these different genotype and how they tolerate salinity. And I'll be talking about 10 and three again and again. And then there is this genotype two, which looks like there is a big drop if you compare performance under salinity as compared to control, but under saline condition, it is still performing very well. So as compared to other genotypes, it's doing really well but there's a big draw. If it was growing in control, it would be a lot better even than this. So the performance would be a lot higher. <clears throat> First two parameters we looked at was shoot height and shoot per plant. Because when you are looking at biomass, biomass two component rates of biomass, maybe one can be, it can be taller. That's why it is too much biomass or there may be too many shoots. So we looked at both that what is leading to higher biomass in these genotypes if they are performing better. So when you look at shoot height, so this is control, this is salt. So look at every single genotype, there's a big drop under salinity for shoot height. And you don't see much 
difference in different DDO type, all of them, they are showing draw and similar type of draw. But when we looked at shoots per plant, so look carefully here, this is genotype three, which I said, I'll be talking again and again. This actually shows a little higher uh, number of shoots per plant under salinity. Look at genotype 10, pretty similar number of shoots under control and salinity. So we figured out that, that the reduction the, as three and 10, they were not showing much reduction in biomass. That is because they were maintaining shoot per plant. That's why their performance was, their short tolerance index was close to one. So shoot per plant is the main component trait uh, for biomass in alfalfa under salinity. So then second thing you look at is iron concentration how plant is handling these different ions, as we talked about ionic phase, right? So sodium is added, and of course, sodium is going to go up in the plant. So you look at different genotypes, all of them, they're showing uh, increase in sodium concentration under salinity as compared to control, all of them. But there's a big difference. Some of them, like three, it will show about 150% increase, but then some of them, they'll show like 300, 400% increase in sodium concentration in the leaves. So that is the main difference. How plants are handling sodium from root to shoot. Uh, how many percent increase there is under high salt concentration. So you look at 10, 10 is showing a little more uh, sodium than three in the leaves. But then there are some genotypes like two, as I mentioned, two, although it performs really well, but it shows big reduction in biomass, maybe because of this. It has lots of sodium in the leaves. So when you look at chloride, similar story here. So you don't see that much variation as you see for sodium, but there is quite a bit of variation. As you see three is relatively less chloride under salinity as compared to others. And on the other hand, 10 stores quite a bit of uh, chloride. So one thing from here we learned that, you know, it is not only how plants handle sodium and chloride, there are some other factors which are playing a role in salinity tolerance uh, in alfalfa. So then we did lots of research, looked at what, what may be the different players playing important role in salinity. <clears throat> so this is just a, a cartoon I drew to combine all the different information I could gather out of literature. So as the plant sees salt, so this is an example of a root cell. So salt goes in. The first step is there is a pathway called as salt overly sensitive, SOS, salt overly sensitive pathway. So this constitutes of three different proteins, sauce one, sauce two, and sauce three. Sodium goes in, sauce three is activated, it interacts with SOS2. So these two proteins, they activate SOS1 and SOS1 is a transporter. So it throws sodium out. So the first step is plant sees the sodium and it throws it out, trying to protect itself from sodium. So, but if the sodium concentration is too high for this system to handle, the concentration of sodium increases in the cytoplasm. And the second system kicks in, that is sodium hydrogen exchangers called as NHX. So it will take sodium and put into the vacuole. Vac vacuole is kind of trash can for the cell. Lots of junk can be put into vacuole. So this is just to maintain low sodium concentration in the cytosol, the extra sodium is dumped into the vacuole. So that is second layer, I, I describe it. Then. If that fails, that is not enough. Then third is extra sodium goes into the xylem. From the root, it goes in the xylem. Xylem, there is no control. Once it is in xylem, it shoots through the leaves. Leaves are very sensitive to salt. So you don't want to expose leaves to high salt concentrations. So then there is another layer here. There is a protein called as high, put, uh, high affinity potassium transporter, HKT1. This takes the sodium back from the xylem just to try to protect leaves from that. 
but whatever it can take out, remaining sodium goes up in the plant. And then there is another layer where plants, they do have some kind of tissue tolerance mechanism that salt concentration is high, but they have to do out something like organic solutes. Proline is one of them. And there are lots of sugars, there is glycine, betaine. So there are lots of organic solutes which plants can store in their leaves just to protect home salt. And then there's another component called a signal transduction, which plays uh, a role in connecting different players, different transcription factors and stuff, regulating salt tolerance in the plant. So this is very complex network. So now, as I said, that not only exclusion of sodium was important or exclusion of chloride was important, there are other players. So we wanted to know what other players. So this is kind of summary slide of lots of lots of genetic data, right? But I put it in color form, so it is a little easier to understand. So what I was talking about in the previous slide was this, that sodium efflux from the root by sauce pathway, sequestration of sodium in the vacuole, retrieval of sodium from xylem, antioxidant and organic solutes, and signal transduction. So I identified all these genes which are studied in model systems, and I studied those in alfalfa, that how these genes behave in alfalfa. And here colors represent green means low expression of that particular gene, red means high expression. Right. <clears throat> so these are genotypes, and L and R represent leaf and root. C and T, they represent control and salt treatment. So one thing very obvious here is that expression of most of these genes is a lot lower in the leaves as compared to the roots. The roots are darker, uh, orange is reddish in color, whereas leaves are greenish in color. So which is expected that roots are going to be playing, playing important role. So these genes are going to be expressed at higher level in the roots. <clears throat> so then you look at comparison of control versus treatment. So for example, here, genotype three in the roots, control versus treatment. If you see darker color on the right side, that means this gene is expressing at higher level in salt as compared to control. So we call it, it is upregulated. Or if it is at lower level, then we call it a downregulated. So in this, you can see many of these sauce genes are upregulated in genotype three. A similar story here, they are upregulated in genotype 10. Then you look at some other, so this component rate, sequestration of sodium in the vacuole, you don't see much difference between control and salt. They are pretty similar level of expression in C and D. But here you, you still see difference that the treatment side is darker, telling you that expression is higher during salt. So maybe this has better sequestration system, this does not. And then you look at another example, uh, for example, tissue tolerance, antioxidant accident organic solutes. So you look at higher expression in this one, but you don't see that here. So, the purpose of this slide is, there are lots of information in the slide, but I just give you three examples here that different genotypes, they differ in the component traits. One may have this trait, other may have the other trait. So the best thing will be if I can take this from here and this from here, and both of them, they got this. So I have, instead of two component traits, now have, I have three component traits. I can build on that three or four or five. So that's what we did. The first thing I did was I made crosses between three and 10 and generated next generation and tried to see that how these component traits can be put together into one single line. So here you see, this is our outside, uh, our outside growth facility. Again, uh, same thing, we have these uh, sand tanks, and below we have reservoirs. We have hundreds of plants growing here. And some of these plants can grow very well at half sea water. So we are already uh, to a level 
where we can release these lines uh, and uh, these lines can be given to farmers that if your soil or water has lots of salt, you can start growing these lines, they'll do fine. They perform at 80, 90% or even sometimes close to 100% level as compared to the salt. So this is the practical part of it, that you are developing lines which are very, very tolerant to salt. But then we also wanted to know why they are tolerating so much salt. So what is happening at genetic level or biochemical level? So in this, our gene expression data showed that these are some of the important genes which are really, really playing role in uh, salt tolerance in alfalfa. Uh, so we wanted to go into detail uh, in understanding these. So we picked one group, that one, sodium hydrogen exchangers. So these sodium hydrogen exchangers are studied in alfalfa uh, at very minimal level, but there is lots of information about sodium hydrogen exchangers in a model plant system called as a Arabidopsis. So we started with Arabidopsis, looked at how many different sodium hydrogen exchangers are present in Arabidopsis. Uh, so there are four sodium hydrogen exchangers and its axis one to four, which are present in vacuole membranes. And then there are two which are present in Golgi, number five and number six, and two of them are present in the plasma membrane, seven and eight. So then we wanted to see that if these are the same exchanger present in uh, Medicago. And we were able to only find six in Medicago. We didn't have eight, we had only six. So number five is missing and number eight is missing. But th these are gene structures. We are not going to go into details of these, but it tells me they have very similar gene structure in Arabidopsis and Medicago. So then we wanted to look at their, how they function. Is that function conserved? To study that, we have to look at their protein sequence. So these are protein sequences of six Medicago genes. So wherever you see red color, that means that protein is, uh, that amino acid is conserved throughout the sequence. For example, here you can see the K throughout in all six uh, proteins we are comparing. So wherever you have this red part, that is the part very important for function of this protein. So all six proteins, they have those kinds of amino acid conserved. That means they must be very important. Otherwise they are not going to be same all the time. And the other thing is, there are these 12 regions. I numbered them one, two, three. So these are called as domains. These are the domains which keep this protein in the membrane. They hang on to the membrane. We call as transmembrane domains. So these all 12 domains are present in Medicago if you compare that to Rhabdopsis. And then we wanted to look at the function. So this function was very well described in yeast. Sodium hydrogen exchanger in yeast was studied in a lot more detail. So where they learned that there are two proline amino acids which help in making a funnel-shaped structure on one side and funnel-shaped structure on the other side of the membrane. So that will make the overall structure of, the, uh, of this transporter. And then there is a uh, glutamate and aspartate amino acid. So which play important role in bringing proton. So glutamate will take this proton and pass it along to this aspartate. On the other side, there is a serine present. The serine will take sodium and that will exchange sodium with this proton. So proton, the sodium goes in, proton goes out. So that's how this exchange is happening between sodium and proton. So then we wanted to see that if this is the same mechanism in Medicago, if this is the same mechanism, these amino acids should be completely conserved in Medicago because they are so critical for this function. So then you look at this, these two proline right next to each other. So these are those two proline and very highly conserved in Medicago in different proteins. And then you look at glutamate, aspartate right next to each other. And then there is serine. 
So although these numbers are not exactly the same numbers you see in yeast because the length of the sequence is different in yeast versus Medicago, but the difference between those amino acids is exactly the same. So they are right next to each other here. So there is a difference of four here. So same thing there. And serine is present at a particular uh, point in the vein eight. So that is present exactly there. So which tells us this mechanism is highly, highly conserved. So Medicago is also doing exactly the same thing as it, it was happening as it was happening in yeast. Joe, do you have a question? So I'll just quickly summarize this, that based on uh, this Medicago experiment, we learned that if we do selection, not only based on biomass, we include iron composition along with biomass. That is very, very effective way of uh, doing selection in alfalfa. Then we were able to do, uh, identify some important genes, which may be critical uh, for salt tolerance in alfalfa. <clears throat> so by looking at gene expression analysis, we were able to classify genotypes based on a particular component traits present in a particular genotype, and which can be later combined together into one genotype, and that genotype can tolerate very, very high levels of salt. And we also showed that by doing bioinformatic comparison, you can identify similar genes in different systems. Like in Medicago, we were able to identify there are like six genes present in Medicago, and we were able to show that they have similar kind of function as they were uh, doing in, in, in yeast and arabidopsis. So this is about uh, Medicago, which is very high, uh, highly salt tolerant. But on the other hand, as I said, I'm going to quickly mention about almonds. We are working on almonds for the last five years. Uh, so there was no information available in almonds about what ions are important, what genetic mechanisms are important. So first thing we wanted to do was we wanted to see what ions are going to play important role in almonds. So here you can see that um, we have different treatments. This is control, this is sodium and sulfate. So we are regulating cations versus anions. So we have sodium sulfate based system sodium chloride based system. So here we have sodium and on these uh, anions, we have chloride and sulfate half and half. So here we have calcium and magnesium half and half and chloride and sulfate half and half. So we wanted to see what is more important here. So we studied 14 different rootstocks in almonds because in almonds, you have a rootstock and on top of that rootstock, you have a cyan. Cyan is your variety, which will give you almonds, but rootstock is better root system. So there are a few different rootstocks which are used commercially in almond industry, and they come from all these different peach, plum, uh, almonds, they're hybrids, all different kinds of rootstocks. So I took all the commercial rootstocks and studied those in this randomized complete block design experiment. So first thing we looked at, we compared the ions. So this is control, this sodium sulfate based system, sodium chloride. So there's a big drop with increase in sodium, but there's an additional drop with chloride, which tells you that not only sodium, chloride is also important player in almonds. Although chloride did not play much role in alfalfa. So, but in almonds, chloride is also very important. So with sodium, there is a drop, but with a chloride, there's a racial drop. So sodium chloride based treatment was more harshest treatment in this case. Then you look at different rootstocks we were studying. And out of these rootstocks, out of these rootstocks, Imperian one was the most tolerant uh, rootstock in terms of survival rate. So then you have Cornerstone, uh, BB106. So these rootstocks, they performed really well. On the other hand, you have Lovell, Guardian, Root Pack 20, and you are going to hear these names again and again. They, they were really bad. Their performance is about like 
20% survival rate, 30% survival rate. They died after one year. So second thing we studied was trunk diameter. So not only survival, so if they are growing, how well they are growing. So that is trunk diameter after one year. <clears throat> so in this case, the pattern is pretty similar. Sodium chloride-based system is the hardest uh, system for, for almonds. And then you look at the genotypes. So look at these genotypes. Imperial one again, Viking, FA, BV106, bad ones, Laval, root pack 20, Kremis KT6, very similar names. So based on that, we were able to classify genotypes that these are more tolerant, these are less tolerant genotypes. Then we wanted to see that what is the mechanism, right? So how these are handling sodium and chloride because sodium and chloride both are very important here. So how these rootstocks are handling sodium and chloride in the system. So here, what I did is I organized these based on sodium chloride concentration treatment three, based on treatment three. So this is sodium concentration in their leaves. So this is organized with increasing sodium concentration in their leaves. So look at these genotype. Imperial one, cornerstone, nickels, very low sodium in the leaves. On the other, the bad ones, Laval, root pack 20, root pack R, very high sodium in their, in their leaves. So, which tells you, yes, sodium is a very important player because these are the tolerant genotypes. They have very low sodium. These are sensitive genotypes. They have very high sodium. Look at chloride, very similar picture. So, Imperial 1, Nickel, Spiking, BB106, very low chloride. On the other side, Laval, Rupac 20, Hanson 536, very high chloride. So, which is telling you that sodium and chloride are telling you the complete picture. When you have low sodium, low chloride in the leaves, these genotypes, they perform better. So little different than alfalfa, where there are other, so many other players playing important role. Here, the main players are how plants are regulating sodium chloride from the roots to, to the leaves. If very little sodium is allowed in the leaves, they are all right. If more sodium chloride is allowed, they are sensitive. <clears throat> there is another ion, potassium. We always study potassium because potassium has an antagonistic relationship with sodium. It's very similar in size, uh, similar, ion, uh, similar, uh, similar type of ion, so similar type of charge. When sodium goes up, potassium goes down, right? So that is known for other plant species. But when we looked at our data, so we found that very weird. Imperium, which, is, which has very low sodium, which is very tolerant, also has very low potassium. Did not make sense at all. So we were very confused that what's happening here. So by staring at this data for some time, I, so I was able to figure out that actually it is not the total concentration of potassium that is important. It is how much drop in potassium is happening as compared to control. So this is control, this is sodium chloride based treatment, treatment three, not much drop. It is maintaining potassium level. So this is good. But when you have something like this, Guardian, control has very high potassium, but in sodium chloride based treatment, it drops potassium level, that is bad. So wherever you see this big drop, like Guardian, like Lover, like root pack 20, all those are very salt tolerant genotypes. So for potassium, it's not overall concentration. It is how much drop you see from control as compared to uh, your salinity treatment. So this big drop, it's not good. So then we looked at some other physiological parameters, photosynthesis, stomatal conductance. Stomatal conductance is how water is moving through stomata. And uh, then chlorophyll content. So out of these physiological parameters, photosynthesis was highly correlated with uh, trunk diameter. So similar pattern you see here, sodium chloride based treatment is the harshest on photosynthesis. This is the same treatment, which was harshest on survival rate and trunk diameter. So which tells you that photosynthesis is an important parameter when you are looking at salinity tolerance in almonds. 
So another biochemical marker, as I mentioned earlier, that proline is organic solute, which provides tissue tolerance. So we studied uh, proline concentration. So we looked at ratio. Treatment three is sodium chloride. Treatment one is control. So ratio of uh, sodium, uh, I'm sorry. So ratio here under salinity versus control. All these genotypes where there is low sodium concentration in the leaves, these are the genotypes where you have low proline ratio. So pretty good correlation. And then you look at with chloride. So it is better correlation with sodium than, than with, with, uh, with chloride. So if I show you this table, this makes perfect sense. I have highlighted this table colored based on the green to red based on favorable to unfavorable. So you look at all these genotypes where the proline ratio is close to one. These are the genotypes where you have less chloride in the leaf, less sodium in the leaf, and high survival rate. Very, very visual, you can see right there. So telling you that proline ratio can be used as a biochemical marker. So instead, if you want to screen large number of uh, rootstocks and you want to see that which of one of those should be tolerant, you just look at body ratio, don't do anything. You don't have to run an experiment for one year to find out that if it's going to be tolerant or not. So very good biochemical marker we were able to identify. And again, this is this is a very complex slide, lots of genes we studied expression for, and this is a root, and these are the leaves. So again, we are looking at treatment one control, treatment three is salt. And these are organized based on their salt tolerance. So this side is tolerant, this side is sensitive. One obvious thing you can see here is for most of the genes we are studying, this side is more yellow and red than this side. So these are showing high expression for most of the genes we are studying than this side, the, the sensitive ones. You do see some change in expression between control and salt, so green versus red. So there is some change. Some of the genes, they showed that. But bigger picture is showing you that all these genotypes, they had better expression anyways. Doesn't matter control or salt. So they are expressing these genes at higher level than these genotypes. So genotypic based differences are more important than control versus salt. So, and these differences are more pronounced at root as compared to leaves. Leaves, you can see that, but it's not very, very obvious. So, so we understood all that. Then we, we thought that we'll try one of these genes, which we know is playing a very important role in tolerance, that is high, potas, high affinity potassium for HKT1. We took this gene from almond, and we tried that gene in Arabidopsis. So in this, this is wild type Arabidopsis. This is mutant Arabidopsis. It does not have that HKT gene. So this is mutant. So then we generated two transgenic lines. I don't know if you guys learned about transgenic plants, genetically modified plants. So these two are genetically modified where we took this gene from armored and put into this mutant. So now, this is a Rabidopsis plant, but containing almond gene for, let's say, salt tolerance, right? HKT1 is one gene which plays a role in salt tolerance. So under control, you don't see much difference. So they all are growing very well. But when you put salt, mutant, of course, is dying. But these two line, transgenic lines, they are surviving a lot better than the mutant. So that tells you that HKT1 from almond is doing the same role what HKD gene from the Arabidopsis is doing. So that is called as functional validation. So we try to see if that function is same in armored versus Arabidopsis. And this is some other data we took. And we took actually lots of other data, but I'm just showing you a couple of uh, graphs here. So relative drive weight in mutant, it was a lot less. In transgenic lines, uh, significantly higher. 
then you see survival rate, same story. So survival rate was a lot better in transgenic mice. Although it is not same as wild type arabidopsis, which tells you that armor gene is not perfectly working in arabidopsis. It is little lower level than its own gene, but it is working. So at the end, I would like to summarize armored experiment. So in this, the first thing we learned was in armored sodium and chloride, both are very important for salinity, for iron toxicity. Second, we were able to classify genotypes based on their salinity tolerance. And when we looked carefully, we found out that all the peach hybrids I do not describe this in detail, but peach hybrids and peach almond hybrids are more, more tolerant than other type of rootstocks. You have some plum-based rootstock, you have peach plum rootstock, you have plum almond rootstocks. So peach hybrids and peach almond hybrids are not better for salinity tolerance. So then when you compare sodium and chloride, all the rootstocks which were showing low accumulation of sodium they were also showing low accumulation of chloride. So there is somehow there is the correlation between sodium and chloride accumulation in almonds. We still did not understand that why. We have not seen that in any other plant species, but we still have to figure it out that why always all those genotypes which have low sodium, they also have low chloride. So when you look at potassium, potassium is very different. Uh, Actually, nobody else described this in this way as I was trying to tell you that for potassium, it is not the total concentration. It is comparison, how much drop there is in comparison to control under salt. So that is more important than overall potassium concentration. So after this experiment, I looked at many other uh, plant species that, that rule holds that it is not overall potassium concentration. It is drop in potassium concentration under salinity. That is more important. So then we learned that photosynthesis, uh, photo, uh, photosynthesis is a very important uh, biological uh, uh, parameter to study salinity tolerance. And proline ratio is another biochemical marker which can be used to screen the salt tolerance genotypes uh, in amides. When we study gene regulation, so expression levels, you see some expression level changes, upregulation and downregulation in control versus salt. But I think bigger differences are the basic expression level differences between these genotypes are more important than salt versus control level of expression differences. And also using complementation analysis, we were able to show that our gene is functional and it plays important role in salt tolerance in, in almonds. So I would like to uh, thank here uh, everybody who's listening. Uh, so it is a great, great pleasure to uh, present this information and share this data with you guys. Uh, and uh, I'll take any questions you may have. Um, I first want to say thank you so much, Dr. Sandhu, for this exceptionally in-depth presentation. Um, and at this time, attendees can send questions through the Q&A feature. Panelists can ask through the chat or just unmute themselves. I, I had a question while they're collecting any others, and, and that has to do with, it seemed like the one time you were doing the gene transfer with cross-pollination? Yes. And then the other time, were you using, I, I don't know much about this, was it CRISPR or was there some other, when you were doing some of the things with the almond, you couldn't do it with the cross-pollination. What kinds of two tools and methods did you use to introduce those different genes? So then you are using traditional approach by cross it, right? So when you make cross it, it is a lot easier to do that in crops which are annual crops. You take like three, four, five months to grow and then it flowers and you make a cross and then you get seed and you grow it again. In two months, you have next generation. 
four months, you have next generation. So within one year, you have a couple of generations clean. But if you are working with trees, it's not very easy, right? With trees, you have to grow the tree. It will flower. You may cross, right? So then we'll set seed. Do you grow that seed? It will grow into tree in a few years. By that time, I will retire. <laughs> so, so, that is, so that is a big problem with, them, with that approach. Although the breeding programs are trying to slowly build on that, and that's how the breeding is happening in the past. But when you are, then you have to show function of a particular gene. You are not developing a new, a new variety, but you just want to see if this gene works or not. That's very easy to test in a smaller system where, for example, a Arabidopsis. It takes like six weeks to grow. And after six weeks, you have seeds. Then you can grow second time. So within like three months, you have three generations. You can check whatever you want in three months. So a lot faster to validate some functions of these genes. But eventually we'll have to identify those genes. Once I know that this particular gene is important, then I can go back and try to screen for that particular gene in germplasm, almond germplasm, which is already there, right? Then I can bring that to the breeding program. So I can tell breeder that next time when you try to, try to develop a rootstock, use this line. So we are collaborating with UC Davis and we have used USDA system where two breeders are working on making the crosses. And sometimes when they make the crosses, they send me the plants here. So we screen those plants here and tell them that, you know, this is good, this is not good, don't use this, use that. But for genetic transformation in a Arabidopsis, it's very, very easy. So you use agrobacterium, you amplify your sequence, you put into a vector, you put that vector into bacteria and let bacteria infect your Arabidopsis plant. So that gene goes into the Arabidopsis genome. So it's, it's very, standardized in Arabidopsis. So that's why it is so easy to do it in Arabidopsis rather than some other systems. Um, we have a question in the Q&A portion or the feature and um, Robert Baker asks, is grafting being used in your research? So yeah. <clears throat> When you are working with uh, all these nut trees, fruit trees, grafting has to happen, right? Because these, the trees which are producing lots of yield for nuts and fruits, their root system is not very good. So you have to take root system which can tolerate lots of diseases, lots of insects, and is very vigorous and then is tolerant to salt and can take lots of nutrients. So you need to identify some root system which is like that and put into a plant which is yielding very high. So it's always beneficial because these trees grow for so many years. Grafting takes a few minutes, right? So you, you pick a nice root and nice type of shoot, you graft them together and then grow it for so many years. So for, for big trees, always, always very good option. And when I'm doing it, sometimes we test only rootstock because we are thinking that we are studying salinity. So rootstock is the main thing, which is providing water and the nutrients and the sorts to the cyan. So in that case, we are studying only rootstocks. But first year I did this experiment, next year I had only grafted plants. So I wanted to see that whatever I studied in only rootstocks is that valid to grafted plants. So then I did a second trial with the grafted plants and you, do, you always have to do that. So yeah, I think the uh, next question is about that complementation analysis in Arabidopsis. We have in one, uh, the part A, we had a picture of plants 
and then B and C we have bar, bar graphs. So in scientific uh, presentations, if you show picture to somebody, that's not convincing enough. What you need to do is you need to show, and not only on these four plants, like in the picture I'm only showing you four plants for each treatment, do you have to do take data on 100 plants? And then you have to run statistics. And based on that, you draw the graphs which were in B and C that what was the survival rate, not only for four plants. In four plants, you cannot study survival rate. One plant dies and that's like 75%. So you, you study 100 plants. And then out of that, you look at your survival rate and then you draw those bar diagrams, standard error, and you run your ANOVA and see is it, is it really statistically significant or not? You have to, you have to use uh, statistical test to show that. That's why B and C was the bar, you, you were looking at the bar diagrams and A was just visual comparison. Sometimes visual comparison is the, the thing you remember better than bar diagrams. That's why it was there on the left side. Yeah. So is anybody concerned about how the almonds taste? I mean, I can get a very salt tolerant almond, but maybe it's not very yummy. Exactly. So that is that is first thing we'll have to do. So for example, uh, last year I got 60 different cross combinations, which breeder made, and they send uh, for screening for salinity. So I'm screening those this year. So if I find something and it does not taste good, does not go anywhere. So there, because you are screen, uh, selecting for so many other things, not only taste, so taste, then there will be um, disease tolerance, there will be insect tolerance, there will be nematode tolerance. So lots of different things are being screened at the same time. So something which is good for everything is going to be the one which is going to be selected. So because otherwise you'll see many of them, but they don't go forward. So I remember one example like that, uh, uh, when genetically modified foods first started coming out in 1994, the tomato was developed. And that tomato, tomato the big problem was that once you harvest tomato, its shelf life is not very good. So you can't keep it for many days. So these uh, geneticists, molecular biologists, who did not have any experience working with the plants, they just knew how to cut the gene, put in there. So those were the scientists who were working in developing that genetically modified tomato plant. So they were able to find a gene which will help there was one enzyme which is degrading cell wall. When cell wall degrades, it becomes soft, right? You don't want your tomato to be very soft, right? So that's what they were trying to handle. So they blocked that pathway. The tomatoes were really good. They will stay on shelf for 15 days, will not become plumpy. So, but that, that was like really good example that you need to be plant scientist if you are working with that. If I, I, I was on his place, I would never start with that variety of tomato, which was already tasting so bad. Nobody was, even though that was staying on the shelf, nobody bought it. So it failed completely. So it was very, we call it as like scientifically, it was big success, but commercially it was biggest failure. So it never, nobody bought it. So, so that is very important. Uh, so you just mentioned about how like you have a ton of parameters that you're searching for, like the taste as well as salinity, uh, like resistance and all that. Uh, so how often do you come across like an actual strain, I guess would be the best word, that like would be successful in all of those areas? <clears throat> so what happens is every few years, whatever crop you are working on, Every few years, there is some additional variety released, right? So those varieties 
then they go to the field, right? So they are tested. In some places, those are successful because there are lots of variation in climatic conditions, even if you consider California, right? Southern California, Northern California, Central Valley. If you go to Imperial Valley, lots of variation in environment condition. So rarely there is a variety which is successful everywhere. So you, your variety can become successful in a particular area, 200 square miles, let's say. So then there's another variety which is successful. These varieties keep coming. So then there are the pros and cons. So if somebody has a high salt in, in his soil or water, they may pick one variety versus the other. Other person may pick other variety. So there are lots of other varieties going on. But in almonds, we don't have much choice. We have very few varieties of almonds at this, at this point. So there is one question about, yeah, explain why wild type did so well. Wild type is a, you can say control variety, right? Which has all the genes. There's no mutation in that. That's why it is supposed to perform well, right? So it can't tolerate salt because it has its HKT1 gene present. So that's why it was good. But in mutant, that gene was mutated. So when that gene is gone, it can perform well. But if you put the other gene to that mutant now, it starts performing well again. So that was the comparison. That control was good, mutant is bad. In mutant, you put almond gene, now it is good again. So to show that, that this gene from almond is working. Exactly. Loss of function and gain of function. Yes. Yeah, no, you cannot use mangrove root system with almonds. So when you develop these uh, rootstocks, they have to be genetically very similar. So for example, plum, peach, almond, uh, you can use these. But even orange, apple, Mangrove is very, very far away. So you can't use those, no. Um, I had a question mm -hmm. and it was, why do the signs of crop tox uh, uh, toxicity from excess salinity first manifest at the top of the plant, even though the salt enters through the roots? <clears throat> so, can you repeat the question? Yeah, so it's, um, why is it that the signs of crop toxicity from excess salinity manifest at the top of the plant, like in the leaves, um, oh. even though that it enters through the roots? Right, so, so I did not talk about a little more detail about, the, about how photosynthesis is interfered by iron homeostasis in the leaf tissue, right? So roots, you have those pipes like xylem, xylem pipes through which water is flowing and in water there are lots of salts dissolved. And of course there are barriers where salt can be stopped, but once salt will reach the xylem, xylem is a pipe of dead cells. There is no regulation at all. That will go up the leaves and the leaves are the places where most of the metabolic process are taking place, photosynthesis, where it is making sugars. So when you, when you have high concentration of sodium, it is going to interfere with the membranes, right? So have you learned about plasmolysis? Plasmolysis, when you put salt on the leaf, cells, they start shrinking, right? So that will start happening, membranes, will start breaking. So the photosynthetic apparatus will break. The stomata, the, where we have potassium chloride concentration present, which is regulating uh, opening and closing of stomata, that will fail because your iron homeostasis is messed up. There's too much sodium and potassium goes down, right? So, so all those things are happening in the leaves and eventually leaves are the one, that's what I said, that leaves are a lot more sensitive than roots, right? Although roots are affected by salinity too, but before roots are affected, leaves are already affected. Plant dies because of uh, leaves are dead, right? 
So root will die too. It will reach to a particular level and root cells will start dying too. But before that, leaf cells already uh, start dying. So that's why you see all those because most of the metabolic process, most of the sugar making, most of the energy comes from the leaves. So leaves are more sensitive and that, that kills the plant. Um, if we have time for one more question, Sadie, can I ask one thing? Yep, go for it. Okay. Um, I was just kind of curious about like how the field of agricultural genetics and your work has evolved um, with the issue of climate change. Yeah, climate change is playing a big role in future agriculture, and it will, because you know when you start seeing these big spells of drought and some regions, lots of rain, that is crops are acclimatized based on a particular climate, right? So particular type of crop grows in Southern California, right? So if that season is changing, then you have to change your varieties towards the changing climate. So right now, that's what we are trying to do, right? So we are trying to develop some varieties which are tolerant to soil. Salinity was not a big problem earlier, but now it is becoming more and more pronounced in the last two decades. There were these big droughts, right? So in 2012, and now last year, again, it started this year was so bad. So next year, farmers are going to feel really, really bad effects of that. And if they, if they are not ready with some varieties which can tolerate drought, which can tolerate salt, that's going to be a big problem. Not only here, even in northern regions where some, some crops need, uh, for example, wheat. Wheat needs uh, vernalization. That means there should be a cold spell of uh, eight weeks. If that did not happen, it will not form seeds. That's called as vernalization, which is required for wheat, winter wheat, right? There are two types of wheat, winter wheat and spring wheat. So winter wheat has to go through that eight weeks of continuous winter spell. So if in the middle you have like one week of very warm weather, you messed up that cycle. So your yields are going to go down drastically. So not only for this region everywhere, if the weather starts changing radically like that, that will have big consequences. Then breeders are going to look for some vernalization insensitive varieties. They'll have to. If that kind of spell became routine, then they'll have to start looking at the varieties which do not need vernalization. So breeders are always looking for what is happening and how they can foresee future 10 years, 15 years, what type of varieties will be needed. Thank you. I also have a question. Sure. Um, so what do you hope, how do you hope to expand your research or what are the next steps for you? So actually I'm keeping very busy. I, I have like 10 different directions where my projects are going right now. So, but as we are working on the current project, every single project, we, we have something which I want to pursue further. Right. So as I was talking about that nanoparticle project, so I'm so impressed with the, our first trial that the, the difference is day and night in germination. And there are some regions where there is high salt and farmers, they sow their seed, they never germinate. Or the germination percentage is 30%, 20%, and does not do very well. After they are germinated, they are still fine. So what I'm thinking that if I can use that nanoparticles 
and treat all the seeds with nanoparticles and then sow that and germination is 80%. So it's a big profit for the farmer and the farmer will be sure that's going to be germinate and will not have to guess that it will be 20%, 30% germination. So that is one thing I'm thinking that is really, really good. I want to pursue that further. I'm already working with some company which can do some trials in the field. So expand on, expand on that side. And also I'm thinking to expand on mechanism sites, uh, basic research that, because most of the basic research is done in Arabidopsis and I'm working on lots of crop plants. So trying to see that if those kinds of mechanisms which are shown in Arabidopsis, they are true for these crops. And as the, the two examples we talked about today, there's lots of variation. Alfalfa, chlorine is not important, whereas in almond, chlorine is very important. And in strawberries, sodium is not important at all. So it is the chlorine, which is more important. So trying to learn that what are the different mechanisms, what makes a particular iron to be more toxic in a particular crop species. So I want to expand on that and what are genetic basis, what are biochemical basis of that and how we can utilize that in the field. That all sounds really interesting. Thank you. Very interesting, yeah. So I love my job. So. <laughs> Good. Um, it doesn't look like there uh, are any questions in the Q&A, so. Yeah, but if somebody comes up with a question later, just shoot me an email. I'm very good with email, I re always reply. Do you want to like put your email in the chat or, because um, I don't think I have it up. Let's see. Where did the chat go? There is a quick Q and A. Can I do something here? Yeah, I I don't know, but um, it's it's getting it's getting uh, towards here eight thirty eight thirty five. So. What we can do, uh, Dr. Sandu, is if anybody sends a question to Sadie or Amanda or Danny, who are our point people for the Selenity Project, or you can send it to me, jwise, J-W-I-S-E, at wildwood.org. Uh, I think I can I just put in the... Oh, yeah, yeah. there you got it. Okay, good. So we're good. Um, Sadie, did you want to close out, or I can... Just thank everyone for coming tonight. Yeah, I'm just gonna say thank you, um, Dr. Sandy, for taking you know time out of your day to come and speak uh, to us and present. It is, it is my pleasure.